case, this discovery might freak you out. A search team in Indonesia spotted Wallace's giant bee. That's Other the name of the bee. That's the Wallace's name. giant bee. <laughs> right. Otherwise known <laughs> as the world's largest bee. I wonder who Wallace was. First person to be <laughs> right? bitten by this giant Probably. bee. Probably. First person to shoo it out of his face. <laughs> it has an estimated wingspan of two and a half inches, and its body is the size of an adult male's thumb. The bee has not been seen by scientists since 1981. Yeah, they actually thought it was extinct. Uh, mining and deforestation is believed to have caused the decline of the Wallace's bee. The oh, Wallace Wall Bee. No, but I think it's the Wallace's Bee. Oh, the Wallace's uh, Bee. The uh, International Union for Conservation of Nature classifies the bee as vulnerable. The team that spotted the bee said that it went from one termite nest, nest to the next looking for the bee. It wasn't until the last day of their search that they found this lone female. I guess. But I guess if it, there's a female, there must be another one someplace, true. right? That's true. And I don't think it's a stinging bee. So it's just scary oh, it looking. I don't think so. But, you know, what do I know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> More than 200 million Americans are in the path of another major winter storm. Snow and sleet across the Midwest has caused treacherous road conditions for travelers. More than 1,000 flights have been canceled nationwide and hundreds more delayed. John Daler is in Des Moines, Iowa with more on the storm. That's the beautiful state capitol building behind me. Iowans are used to snow, but even they are saying enough. In anticipation of last night's snowfall, they closed a number of schools or announced delayed openings, and they put 600 snowplows on the road. The combination of these frigid temperatures plus the high wind and the icy roads means it's a very dangerous road conditions for the millions of people in the path of this massive storm. The effects of the storm will be felt in nearly every state east of the Rockies. Parts of Kansas saw more than seven inches of snow. It came down so fast and heavy, plows couldn't keep up. Cars and trucks slid off the highway. Some good Samaritans tried to help out other stranded drivers, and others teamed up to push cars back onto the road. I'm ready for it to be gone. I honestly want someone to be here. The dangerous mix of snow and ice in New Mexico led to this scary spin-out that could have been much worse. The storm system stretched all the way down to Georgia, where heavy rain flooded streets in Atlanta. Albania is on fire. The small Balkan nation has been engulfed in massive anti-government protests which literally left a stain on the face of the country's prime minister. The country's opposition decided to destroy their parliamentary mandates, no kick the system out of order. So what is going on? Well, the allegation the authorities face is no joke. A lot of people are certain the government is working hand in hand with drug lords. A parliament that is not the product of the vote of the people, but is a product, as has been exposed by judicial wiretapes published by the international media, of organized crime cooperating openly with the current government. Alleged leaked phone calls of one of the country's most notorious cartels revealed dozens of Albanian MPs were happy to use the gang's influence and, well, persuasion skills to buy votes in the general election, which the ruling party won by a landslide. Wiretaps also led to the official investigation into Albania's former interior minister. He stands accused of passive corruption, drug trafficking, and of being an active gang member. And here comes the twist. The prosecutors can't really do anything but prowl around him, since Albania's prime minister has refused to revoke his diplomatic immunity, shielding him from the law. The official position was to deny everything. With every allegation of corruption, you know, there are, there are documented evidence and there is allegations. Um, but in this instance, there are significant documented and evidence links between the current government, organized crime, money laundering and the trafficking of drugs. And I think it needs to be ascertained as to whether the 2017 elections were free and fair or whether there was vote buying and vote rigging going on. Um, and I think that is why people are, that was sort of the cherry on the cake, you know, why people feel that there needs to be some action taken.
And it could be a case of just a few bad apples, but the opposition says it is not. The sheer scale, really, of the drug operations in Colombia of Europe is mind-blowing. This tiny nation has become one of the biggest transit hubs for heroin, cannabis and cocaine smuggling. Racketeering, a servile police force in the pocket of crime lords. Politicians enabling the drug trade instead of fighting it. This is what Albanian protesters say drives them to the street. Yet so far, they've mostly been told to shut up and know their place. Threat by the Democratic Party, the Socialist Movement for Integration and other opposition parties to abandon their mandates in Parliament undermine the basic principles of democracy. Yeah. A political protest is apparently a violation of democracy in the US rulebook. The same US, by the way, that suffers from a severe drug problem of its own. At least two people have reportedly been killed and more than a dozen others injured in clashes between the Venezuelan military and protesters near the country's border with Brazil. Demonstrators have been demanding that the border be opened to allow aid through. At the same time, extra security forces have been dispatched to the area. The military reportedly opened fire on the demonstrators. Three of those injured are said to be in critical condition. The local mayor also confirmed 27 military servicemen were captured by protesters after the clashes broke out. Well, it comes after confusion around the border crossing as President Nicolas Maduro closed the frontier with Brazil amid a row over humanitarian aid. But then the self-proclaimed President Juan Guaido ordered it reopened. The opposition leader has spoken about today's bloodshed, urging the military to choose sides. Twelve people have been injured and one killed as a result of this crime. Our thoughts are with them. This will not go unpunished. Decide on which side you're on. To all the military, between today and tomorrow, you will define the way in which you want to be remembered. We already know you're on the side of the people. You've made that very clear. Tomorrow, you'll be able to prove that. Earlier, Venezuelan security forces clashed with an opposition convoy heading to the border with Colombia on its way to collect stockpiled US supplies. US-backed opposition leader Juan Guaido set a Saturday deadline for the aid to be delivered exactly a month since he proclaimed himself the country's leader. President Maduro's banned US aid amid claims it would be used to smuggle in weapons. But he said that all aid from the EU is welcome. Aceptar. The Venezuelan government accepts the offer of humanitarian technical assistance from the European Union through the United Nations system to Venezuela. Welcome. The point of the U.S. aid is it's not being given to the government, it's being given to their hand-picked uh, guy, Juan Guaido. Uh, to, so it, it's totally a propaganda move. Everybody knows it's a propaganda move, and uh, it's it's just to incite violence so that they have a pretext to, uh, to invade or to uh, support uh, third-party troops. It's certainly uh, the result that the United States government and the Venezuelan opposition want. They want violence on the border uh, as a pretext to uh, overthrow the democratically elected government of Nicolas Maduro. Meanwhile, an anti-Maduro concert on the Colombia-Venezuela border, dubbed Venezuela Live Aid, has been organised by a British billionaire. Artie's Dan Cohen reports from the scene. You can see this concert taking place behind me. Um, it's thrown by the British billionaire Richard Branson, who's using it to uh, pressure Nicolas Maduro, the Venezuelan president, to open the border to uh, what the U.S. government says is humanitarian aid. Now, the organizers say that they're expecting 300,000 people to be here, but so far, uh, I estimate there's about 5,000. Venezuelan government has thrown its own, uh, its own concert on its side in the name of, uh, under the banner of Hands Off Venezuela, denouncing what it says is uh, an intervention by the United States and its allies. It also offered, uh, it also said it would send its own humanitarian aid to uh, Colombia, to the impoverished residents of Cucuta, but Colombian uh, President Ivan Duque has rejected this and refused to let that aid in. While there's certainly the possibility of things escalating as they have done on the, on the Brazilian-Venezuelan uh, border. For now, there's no sign of any kind of violence, but there are um, there is the presence of some extremist figures on this side, including Lawrence Saleh, who's actually uh, 
who was uh, found guilty of plotting terror attacks inside Venezuela. And this is a figure who's actually taken money from the American government to, uh, through the National Endowment for Democracy. So certainly all the ingredients are there for violence to break out, but we're certainly hoping that uh, everything will pass peacefully and calm. Well, the Venezuelan opposition's envoy to Washington says that unique, all eight Venezuelan consular offices in the U.S. are no longer functional. While giving the speech, Carlos Vecchio was confronted by anti-war activists. I want to say these people are fraud. They don't represent the Venezuelan people. They are representing the U.S. orchestrated coup. This is a very dangerous situation. They want to create a crisis at the border that would be a justification for U.S. intervention. The woman you saw in that video there was Medea Benjamin from the Code Pink anti-war movement. She says the opposition is knowingly stoking tensions at the border. I think it's a, a dangerous game that the opposition is playing. They really are trying to create a confrontation. If it was about humanitarian aid, they could have used the U.N. agencies uh, and uh, certainly there are lots of other ways to get humanitarian aid into Venezuela. Uh, they are doing this purposely on the borders because they want to see a confrontation. They want uh, the uh, Maduro government to respond with violence so they can show the whole world and use that as a pretext to start the next phase of this, which would be a military one. So I think it really is the opposition that is playing this very dangerous game and using the aid as a prop in their playbook. And when Venezuela is free, and Cuba is free, and Nicaragua is free, this will become the first free hemisphere in all of human history. President Trump declaring he will make the Western Hemisphere a beacon of freedom as he vows a new day is coming for Venezuela and Latin America. Joining us now, Isaias Medina, former senior UN diplomat for Venezuela, and Brett Bruin was a diplomat during the Obama administration. Welcome to you both. Good to have you with us. Good to be with you. Thank you so much, Anna, for having me. Appreciate uh, it. Isaiah, I want to start with you. Um, what did you make of the speech today? I mean, the, the you know, um, National Security Advisor, former Ambassador Bolton said it's not about the military, the U.S. military getting involved and forcing aid across the border. But the president keeps saying uh, everything's on the table. Absolutely. And I, I have to tell you, first of all, please allow me to thank President Trump and his team, not only for the immense humanitarian aid effort, for his continued support, but also and most importantly, for bringing back hope to the Venezuelan people. And today, it was incredible. It was a final notice to allow the humanitarian uh, aid to come in uh, 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 in a very peaceful way. Otherwise, I believe that they will face the consequences. He was very clear to point out that all the options are still on the table. Mm -hmm. And Brett, I know that you think there were some positives about the speech, but you had a concern as well that it seemed portions of it at least very much directed at a U.S. domestic audience and talking about the evils of socialism, um, you know, potentially as a, as a rallying cry here in the U.S., not strictly to do with Venezuela. Yeah, and this isn't a left or right issue. It's a right or wrong issue. I, I really firmly believe that uh, both Democrats and Republicans should uh, come behind a policy of strong action on Venezuela. Uh, unfortunately, what the president said today in Miami, I, I don't think reached across the aisles. I don't think it reached across the political spectrum. President Trump will head to Vietnam next week for a second summit with North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. The president last met with Kim last year at a summit in Singapore to discuss denuclearization. That has not yet happened. Negotiators are reportedly already in Hanoi preparing for the meeting. On Friday, Mr. Trump said America's relationship with the North was good. He also repeated claims about the status of U.S. relations with North Korea before he was elected president, claims that have been thoroughly debunked. If I were not elected president, you would have been in a war with North Korea. We now have a situation where the relationships are good, where there's been no nuclear testing, no missiles, no rockets. We got our hostages back. 
Uh, we have many of the remains back and coming back rapidly. The remains of our great warriors from many, many years ago, and the families are so thrilled and so happy. Uh, we've had a great relationship. Uh, the Singapore was a tremendous success. Only the fake news likes to portray it otherwise. We would have gone, we would have been, we would have literally been in a war with North Korea, in my opinion, had I not been elected. Julia Manchester is a reporter for The Hill and joins us now from Washington. So, Julia, what are negotiators from both sides preparing for with this upcoming summit? What do they hope will come from it? Well, I think on the U.S. side, there's definitely a preparation for trying to get some movement on denuclearization. You know, even though the president says Singapore was successful last year, we haven't seen North Korea actually take further major steps to denuclearize. You know, we have U.S. intelligence saying there is still evidence that there is um, work on nu nuclear energy and weapons in North Korea, and Kim hasn't gotten rid of, you know, various weaponry that he essentially said he would in the first time during the first summit. So I think there is going to be some further work on that. And I think President Trump is going to face a lot of pressure from Democratic lawmakers when he gets back to the U.S. on the status of what happened in the summit. Summit, You know, you're already seeing Democrats demanding a full briefing as to what the two discussed during this, tri during this trip. So I think denuclearization will absolutely be on the table. But, you know, President Trump faces a lot of pressure from his intelligence community, as well as Democrats, from, quite frankly, a failure to get Kim to do what he essentially what was essentially demanded last year. Julia, when you talk about what's on the table, the president said that removing troops from the Korean penil peninsula is not on the table. Do you think that'll be a sticking point? Um, it very well um, could potentially be a sticking point. You know, I think President Trump wants to keep, as well as the U.S. intelligence community, for that matter, wants to keep a U.S. presence in that region. However, I think it's gonna, going to be um, create some problematic issues with North Korea, because they obviously want to maintain their sphere of influence in that region. So that could definitely be a tension point between the two sides in this, you know, major goal to get to denuclearization. President Trump, we know, met with the Chinese officials for continuing trade talks. This is ahead. There's got, they've got a March 1st deadline before these tariff increases kick in. I want to play for you what the president had to say on Friday. We're having very good talks. There's a chance that something very exciting could happen. We're getting uh, a 10 percent tariff on $200 billion worth of goods. The 10 percent goes up as of March 1st. It goes to a 25 percent number. So we'd be getting 25 percent on 250 billion, and there's about 267 billion that's untariffed, untouched, which we discuss later. But if we can make a deal, we wouldn't have to bother with that discussion. Now to the Netherlands, which has the highest concentration of reported sexual abuse in the Catholic Church. Church leaders in the country claim to be pioneers for formally recognizing and compensating victims that came out of the shadows after 2010. But a new report shows bishops were aware of abuse for decades and covered it up. CBS News foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett spoke to one survivor who's seeking answers from the Vatican. And a warning here for you, some of what you're about to hear may be disturbing and not suitable for younger viewers. Do you remember yourself being a little girl? The important part of my childhood is uh, the priest. The priest, Father Jacques Stiegs, who stole Brigitte Kicken's innocence at nine years old. He said, you are bad because you make me do this. We have something special, the two of us. And when you tell this to your parents, you will not go to heaven and you will never be an angel. Wait, this one. So her parents had no idea what was church? happening when the priest idea. offered to look after her on weekends. It starts with a kiss and it becomes more and more and more. He never raped me, but you can also um, do it by your mouth. Um, I had to um, make him feel good with my hands. She this did what she could to bury the past until she realized the extent seven, six, of sexual seven. abuse in the Catholic Church. I became very ill because, oh my God, it didn't only happen to me, it All happened these memories. to more. Brigitte was not alone. In fact, the Dutch government commissioned an independent study that estimated as many as 20 thousand children could be the victims of sexual abuse. This in a country with a smaller population than the state of New York. 
We asked Cardinal William Ike, the country's highest ranking Catholic clergyman, why the church failed to recognize the problem. Um, church leaders, but also other people in, uh, the, in society were not aware of the negative effects of sexual abuse of minors on these people. And they, that, I'm you sorry, know, they weren't aware of the negative effects of sexual abuse? Sexual abuse of minors on the victims. You know? He's also been a they bishop since 1999, the period of abuse, but insists he knew nothing about it. Did you know other bishops that had covered it up? No. No. That's no, very hard for me to believe your evidence. It's, it's a relatively small community. Yeah. But, How many bishops are there? Yeah, but nobody talked about it in the bishops' conference. That's incredible. The Catholic Church in the Netherlands has since commissioned its own report, detailing abuse and compensating victims. Brigitte received the maximum amount, more than $100,000. But that was before she learned the church knew about Stieg's and his abuse of other children. They knew that he was abusing, sexual abusing children. And they didn't look to this and they looked the other way. Your Holiness, was it not God? She's written a letter to the, the Vatican to answer to for the cover-up, and she's traveled to Rome to deliver it in person. Three years later, she's yet to hear anything back. What do you want to hear? What I do, want, do really do need to hear is that somebody of the church is saying, yes, we knew it, and we look to the other side. I'm still waiting. But it might never be enough. Brigitte says she can't possibly forgive no. because that child can never forget. Partly I'm happy now. Only this little child is still asking for love. Charlie Daggett, CBS News, Maastricht, the Netherlands. To the Vatican now, where day two of a historic summit addressing decades of sex abuse in the Catholic Church is underway. Pope Francis and church leaders are focusing on holding priests and bishops accountable. Around 190 Catholic officials are attending the unprecedented summit. Survivors are demanding a zero-tolerance response after decades of abuse and cover-ups. So for more on this, we want to bring in Massimo Fagioli. He's a theology and religious studies professor at Villanova University, and that's where you join us from. Thank you so much for uh, being with us, Massimo. So let's talk about you. Uh, you know the summit so far. It's, it's only been one day, but you know some critics are concerned that they're hearing from the Pope, cardinals, bishops, other Catholic leaders, Basically, nice words. Uh, this is bad. Don't do it. Thoughts and prayers. Reflection. But they want a conference that's actually going to result in some concrete change. Is this just a show, or do you think they're really working towards a solution here? Well, first of all, uh, the impression that it may be just a show, it is legitimate. Let's not forget that the Vatican in the 16th, 17th century was built to be a theater. A stage and so some shows can change reality and this I believe is a meeting that can change things because uh, a, a few significant changes have happened already the big problem now is how to hold bishops and cardinals accountable this is something that we're still looking for a solution for that Massimo, the Pope has been the leader of the Catholic Church for six years. Some abuse survivors say that he has backed down from pushing a zero-tolerance policy. What is stopping him from fully addressing the sex abuse crisis and implementing church law on how to report crimes to local police and ultimately punish the clergy involved? So I think the survivors have every right to be angered, uh, angry. I, be, I believe Pope Francis has enacted change. Let's not forget that uh, after the election of Francis in the Catholic Church, we had a long series of bishops that have been fired by the Vatican, something that was new. We have uh, new bodies that were created in the Vatican and locally. Now, this crisis is not a legal crisis because legal tools uh, have been there in place for centuries. It's a crisis of leadership and it's a crisis of culture because in many countries the situation is compared to the United States 20 or 30 years behind 
included my own, uh, uh, my own country, Italy, where they are just talking right now to do something like the John Jay report that the U.S. bishops decided in 2002. That gives you an, an idea of what this meeting is about, is to raise the level of consciousness in churches that are different from the United States and where many uh, things still have to be done. Massimo, these sexual abuse allegations have been going on for decades now. Um, and, you know, certainly we've had these sort of more recent reports. I'm thinking about the report out of Pennsylvania that was particularly disturbing. It almost seemed like they were sort of organized pedophile rings working within the Catholic Church. What is the process to screen seminarians and what has the church done so far to root out pedophiles? So the good news is that if we look at the case of the United States after 2002, which is when the U.S. bishops put in place effective policies, the number of cases has declined dramatically. So here, new uh, systems of screening, of evaluations, of ongoing formations have been put in place. A growing number of states are beginning to pass laws that would immediately ban abortion if Roe versus Wade is overturned. According to new reporting from CBS News digital reporter Kate Smith, five states currently have so-called trigger laws banning abortion on the books. And four more states have proposed the legislation to do so. And Kate joins me now to discuss this. Kate, thanks so much for being with us. First off, why are these called trigger laws? That's a great question. They're called trigger laws because they're effectively useless right now. So Arkansas just passed this bill. It's in effect. Excuse me. It's not in effect. Right. That's the whole point, right? It can't do anything except for just sit in text. The whole thing, all of these laws get triggered if and only if Roe v. Wade becomes overturned. Can it be challenged then? They can't actually because they don't do anything. Right. You can't challenge a law that's not in effect because there's nobody that would have been impacted by these laws. Right. So how many states and which states have passed? Sure. So we have five states so far. We have Arkansas most recently. We have North and South Dakota, with Louisiana and Mississippi. And these are on the books. They're on the books. Wow. And what are the factors that are giving lawmakers the confidence to propose and pass these laws? It's all one thing. It's all the Supreme Court and where how it's made up. For the first time since 1973, these politicians actually feel like there is a chance that Roe v. Wade might become overturned. And if not completely overturned, significantly chipped away at. And when we store in the story, we speak to one person who says, in an ideal world, Roe v. Wade becomes effect virtually ineffective. Right. They're not doctors, but they too are leading the fight against breast cancer. Engineers at this Parisian startup are collecting images from hospitals from around the world. Here, all the engineers are working on data processing. Their goal is to collect all the data from available mammograms and teach the machine to automatically detect cancer. This startup specializes in artificial intelligence that studies millions of mammograms and can now pinpoint if there's a risk of cancer in new X-rays. Here's a mammogram screening. A radiologist would typically examine this for any potential dangers. The algorithm works the same way. It will look over the image and stop as soon as it thinks there's a risky zone and flag it up with this yellow box. It helps the radiologist decide if they need to do more exams or not. Therapixel is just one of several startups that are hosted at Hospital Cochin's incubator. Paris Biotech Santé was created 20 years ago, and it's now the largest hub for medical startups in Europe. With over 5,000 square meters, thousands of jobs created, and millions of euros in funding to develop multiple projects. These innovations improve patient care, ultimately finding solutions for recovery faster than big companies. In France, we're lucky to have excellent engineering schools and medical schools. It means there can be a lot of synergy between scientists and it ends with fast results. Nikos Paragios is a polyvalent researcher. The mathematics professor founded an award-winning company less than two years ago. Terra Panacea uses artificial intelligence to develop contouring in radiation therapy. 
Here you see the patient's eyes, the two optic nerves, the lenses and the chiasms. This step's crucial at the beginning because you need to know where and how much you're going to dose the different parts of the eye. This technology helps doctors to be more precise when they are targeting tumours. Nikos Paragios calls it on-the-fly radiation. Patients usually have to undergo two to three months of radiotherapy. Their anatomy doesn't stay the same, they lose weight and their organs will swell. On-the-fly radiation means we can adjust the treatment according to your body that day, so we can reduce side effects and have a very precise treatment plan after five sessions.
the president is building out his campaign early so that he's got a straight shot to be the GOP nominee in 2020. A big part of that, as you mentioned, is adding more senior level staff. Today, the campaign announced the hiring of communications director Tim Murtaugh, press secretary Kaylee McEnany, and strategic communications director Mark Lauder, who's a former aide to Vice President Mike Pence and who you're about to talk to. Cole Blocker was also added as finance director and Megan Powers as an operations director. The core of the campaign has been in place for about a year, including campaign manager Brad Parscale, who spoke to Martha about strategy back in January. Watch. As being an incumbent, we're building a different operation now that we have 2016. In 2016, it was very grassroots. As you know, the campaign sometimes at its best um, operated at a, at a fraction of what probably was needed. It was, it was mobile. It was changing. It was adapting. It was just, this was a, a man running his first candidacy ever. And um, in 2020, the operation is different. This is going to be a much larger ground game. Parscale came on board a full year earlier than campaign managers for both George W. Bush and Barack Obama. The president's daughter-in-law, Laura, will serve as senior advisor. Former Massachusetts Governor William Weld is challenging the president for the Republican nomination, but it is going to be a long shot because the Republican National Committee has already said it will support the president, meaning there are no sanctioned debates, and the National Party is working with state party organizations to line up delegates for the Republican national convention next year. Then there's the money. The president will enter the election cycle with an enormous fundraising lead over Democrats. Just in the last three months of 2018, the Trump campaign and its affiliates raised $21 million, putting the re-election balance at an astounding $129 million. At the same time in 2010, President Obama had $4 million. In 2002, George W. Bush had $3.2 million. The Republican Party has also maintained a robust staff in key battleground states to counter the growing list of Democratic presidential hopefuls. Now, all of that said, a new Washington Post ABC poll says 56% of all Americans say they would definitely not vote for Trump should he become the nominee. Martha. Yep, uh, they see him as beatable in that poll. Here now with more, Mark Lauder, that newly minted strategic communications director for the Trump campaign, and Chris Hahn, radio host and former senior aide to Senator Chuck Schumer. Chris, let me start with you. Is that amount of fundraising daunting to Democrats at this stage of the game? Well, when you look at his cash on hand, he only had $19.5 million. I don't know what he's been spending all this money on so early in the campaign. Cash on hand is really what matters. He well, has those may be commitments that haven't come ads. in yet. I don't know. Mark can answer that in a second. But well, go ahead. Well, no, that's not usually, that's not how it works. It's, you know, you're, what you've raised is what you've taken in, and $19 million on hand should scare him. Bernie, Bernie Sanders uh, raised $3.5 million today, so he's, you know, not too far behind the president. He's only been campaigning for a well, couple let, of hours. Let's just start there. Hold on. Mark, how do you respond to that? I'm curious. Well, let's let's remember, too, that the president has been on the campaign trail since uh, since very early last year, having mega rallies, attracting tens of thousands of people. Those are the kinds of things that the campaign is currently paying for. So in addition to having one of the most sophisticated staff build outs that we are currently in the process of doing, he's also busy having mega rallies, as we've seen just in so recent So you're saying weeks. that's where the money's going so far into those there's, rallies? There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of money that goes there. And uh, but but there's Hasn't no helped. question the president is going to have uh, all of the support and all the money he needs to easily win re-election in 2020. All right. I want to play a soundbite from Bernie Sanders, um, which I think goes to the heart of, of what the, the argument against the president is going to be and get your reaction. Let's play that. I think he is a pathological liar every day. I also think he is a racist, a sexist, a homophobe, a xenophobe somebody who is gaining cheap political points uh, by trying to pick on minorities, often undocumented immigrants. So the pro argument is going to be, you know, some sort of socialist leaning idea about things like $15 minimum wage and free college and some of those ideas. And then the, op the opposing perspective to President Trump is going to be he's a bad guy, Mark. 
And it's just ludicrous. And I understand that Bernie Sanders is trying to stand out from the 50 socialists that are now running. He's no longer unique <laughs> and quirky. He's just another socialist running for the Democrat Party. Uh, the president's going to run on results. And, and whether it's women, whether it's African Americans and minorities, they know that they've got more money in their paychecks. They know they have more jobs because of this president's leadership. And, you know, the, the nonsense that you see coming from the Democrats on this, uh, they'll sort their socialism. Uh, uh, platform out. They'll nominate well, a socialist. Well, it's, it's we'll not, go for freedom. Clearly not all Democrats that so, are running are talking that way. Amy Klobuchar is saying, look, you know, wake up. We cannot pay for college for everyone for but free she in this Medicare country. For all. And Howard Schultz, who so, is running as an independent, um, says that you know, there's no way that any opponent can oust Trump, no matter how far to the radical left they are. It's a fallacy. Chris. Uh, look, I think that whoever the Democrats nominate is going to have a very good chance of beating a president whose numbers have, have remained in the low 40s his entire presidency. He has never been above 50 percent in his polling average. He's at 41 percent now. Mark, I love you. I hope uh, I hope the president runs so you can have a job for two years, but I'm not so sure he's going to run. I think that the guy thinks I can only play for the tips for so long in my lifetime, and maybe I'm going to spend my summers doing that and not going to rallies because I think that he knows that things are only going to get worse for him politically in the next two years and even thereafter. And I think if he decides not to run again, he could claim victory for whatever he thinks he accomplished in the last four years and move on with his life and enjoy it. And I, don't I, think know, I don't know about you. I, I have no happen. idea and what's in the president's mind, but I don't think he's thinking that at all. That's just my I, I guess watching how this you. is going. Mark, you, you're uh, well, working with him. What do you think? <laughs> I can guarantee you 100 percent that President Donald Trump is running for early election. He's focused on it and he cannot wait to take his message of success to the American people and contrast it with this radical socialist platform that Democrats now stand yeah. for. And we'll and we and we will see Chris, how like, no, middle Chris, America Chris, is going to figure you, that you, out. You're shooting down that the, the socialism side of this. But, you know, I mean, when even across like Kamala Harris, you know, is is one of the most popular candidates running so far. Vice President yeah. Biden, Joe Biden, we don't know whether or not he's going to get in. Bernie Sanders is the second on the list in terms of polls. He is clearly in favor of these socialist ideas. Kamala Harris has said that she's open to removing people's private health care. I mean, these are very radical ideas to most Americans, and they so, represent some of the uh, strongest candidates so far in the race. <laughs> I think when you call them socialism, people think they're radical. But when you then break them down and talk about what they are, providing health care for all Americans, providing affordable trillion even dollars. free college tuitions for That's all Americans. What about what they cost? I think people are, uh, Mark, hold, hold on a minute, Mark. I think when you break those things down, people then like them. We already have socialist-like programs in this country. It's called Social Security. It's called the VA. It's called the Army. It's called police forces. It's called roads. But Republicans want to, instead of talking about ideas, they want to demonize people who have those ideas and call them socialist and not try to engage in an actual debate about how we're going to do things to make this right. country Mark, better. Final thought, and I, I think that go. that's their problem. And by I the way, that's why they lost in the midterms and that's why they're going to lose the next time. And that's why, Mark, the president is not going to run for re-election. Trust me. Could be. Mark, quick, Mark, very quick, Mark. I'm Absolutely. I, you, when you say that we're going to take people's <laughs> private health insurance away from them and just put them on government health care against their will, I'll have that debate every day. All right, we got to leave it there. Thank you, gentlemen. Saying. We'll do it again soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks.